Amen. Well, you can be seated, Amen. everybody. We're glad to have all of our friends joining us online. We, um, you know, we just made a lot of new friends, and we're so thankful for you and the the kind things that you say to us and the nice things that you you mentioned and how you're receiving from God's word. There are people receiving from God's word all Amen. over the place, you know, and we're real thankful for that. And we don't take you for granted. We know you don't have to be there. We know you're there by choice. And uh, we, during this uh, time where we all been locked up and everything, we just didn't know how to reach our church. And so we started doing this so we could reach our family here. And our family's gotten a lot bigger through this. And so uh, there, there are bad things that happen but God turns some bad things into a lot of really good things. And so you're one of those good things, and we're glad for you. Amen? Amen. You know, I just want to say tonight, we were just singing about it, that God is a good God. Amen. And that is something I just want to remind us all about tonight. Amen. God is a good God. And I didn't know that for a long time. And so I, I lived really in a lot of defeat mm -hmm. because I didn't understand that. God is good and he does want to do good things for his people. He's for us. And if God be for you, who can be against you? You know, and, and a lot of times things like that, God is good. And then the ref refrain is all the time, you know, and we hear that. And that's good. And I don't, I don't, certainly don't speak ill of that. But sometimes real important things turn into cliches, and those cliches begin to take the meaning from us. We just get accustomed to things. And uh, Jesus made some statements that I think are, are really significant because we see the God of the Old Testament. We see Moses up on the mount receiving the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments, the, the tablets in stone written by the finger of God. And we see the thunders and the lightnings and the harshness and the, and the fear that could be attached to that. But when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and, and all the things that he did there, when he healed the multitude or fed the multitudes and healed the sick and did all the things that he did, he said very clearly for us, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you have another interp interpretation of God other than the one that Jesus gives you, you got the wrong interpretation. And sometimes our imaging is really important. Jesus, you know, he, he's God. I mean, you know, he's almighty. But he came to touch us. He came to live among us. He said, I'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Mm -hmm. So he's not harsh with us. I mean, he can scold us when we need it and things of that nature. But he doesn't even scold you unless there's something of benefit in there for you. He wants to help you. He really does. And we can rest assured of that. And so that image, you know, to say God is good, that's a really important thing because he is good. It was a very um, important revelation yeah. for me. Yeah. Because when you think God may be doing things against you because he doesn't love you or, yeah. you know, those kinds of things. And if you're ignorant of the truth, then you believe that just like I did. I, I didn't know that. And so when I learned that God is good and his mercy endures forever, Amen. it changed my life. A lot of times our guilty conscience forms that image because we, we're, we're we're, we know we're not worthy of it. But that doesn't stop him. He said, Jesus died for the ungodly. Well, I qualified. You know, I wasn't godly. So if... Um, I have to, I, if I have to merit his love, I'll never get there. You can't merit it. You just have to receive it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Well, we're going to get in the word here in a minute. We're going to receive our regular Wednesday evening offering. It's church night for us. And so we always receive an offering on Wednesday night when we come to you. And many of you out there are very faithful in your giving with us. And, uh, we, we want you to know, we don't take that for granted. We're very, very thankful for you and how God uses you to make a difference. You're a difference maker through your giving and we, we uh, appreciate you, we love you. We'd love you if you didn't give, but we are thankful that you do because we need it and God's work needs it and you're a part of that and so we're very thankful for that. And so there's a way there that Nora will explain that you can do that. Yes, you can give online or through text, or if you want to mail it to the church, that'd be fine, and we'll receive it and bless it. 
Amen. Well, we're going to pray over your offering, and we're going to pray over the Word, and we'll get right into it. Now, Father, we want to thank you for our precious friends all over here in the house and in other places around the country and in some other countries even. We thank you for their faithfulness. And, Father, yes. as they give and as they sacrifice, we, we, we want you to know that we trust you for a harvest in their life. We pray for that harvest. Good seed and good soil is entitled to a abundant harvest. Yes. And we believe for that harvest for them. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And we thank you for it. And, Father, as we open your precious book and look inside this holy word of God, we ask you tonight to speak through uh, me and Nora and give the hearer ears, spiritual ears to hear and eyes to see and behold wondrous things from your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're in a series. We've been doing this in the church and we've been doing it here on our uh, Wednesday evening uh, sessions together. But we've been talking to you the pro about the priority of God's word. And when you have a priority, that means you put it above other things. It, it's prioritized in your life. We've used as our text passage, uh, Proverbs 4 and verse number 20, he said, my son, attend to my words and incline thine ear unto my sayings. And so that word attend means to put it first. And one translation says to pay attention to, to the word. And the other, another translation says, listen well to my words. And I think as you put God's word as a priority in your life, I think a lot of life's uh, clutter in a lot of life's uh, distractions and a lot of life's problems, they get put in the right place, proper place. Because God's word has an ascendancy over uh, difficulties, challenges, and all sorts of things. You say, but you mean by reading the word we can, we can find victory? I mean exactly that. The Bible says his, his, his word uh, shined in the darkness, the light shined in the darkness. And he's talking about the light of his word. The light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. That, that word comprehend actually means uh, to be able to overpower. There's, there's never been, you go in the darkest cave and, and I've visited some of these uh, caves, you know, just things we do. And there's some real nice caves around here in East Tennessee, you know, tourist attractions and different, different things. But They'll always surprise you and they'll cut off all the lights, you know, to show you how dark it really is where there's no light at all. But in the midst of all that, you can take just a little old bitty match or any form of light at all and you can light it and it'll light up the, the, the environment. Now, granted, it's a small light, but it is a light. And, you know, we're, we're told to not curse the darkness, but to, but to set our light, our, our candle on a stick. You know, don't, don't hide it under a bushel, Scripture says, but set that light on a candlestick so that it can light up uh, the room for others or light up the pathway for others. And so the Bible gives us these analogies so we'll know. And the, and the word, again, comprehend means to overpower. You've never seen a time, it's, it's, it's in the impossibility for darkness to be able to overpower light. It does not happen, and it will never happen. And the Bible says Jesus is the light of the world, but he also said you are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And so he's the greater light, we're lesser light because he lives in us, but together we make a greater light. We are the body of Christ. And so together we have this ability together to do what he does personally. Each of us have a part of Jesus' ministry. Each of us do. And so we put those pieces together and we form the whole of the body of Christ. Amazing thing, but it's the way it works. Yeah. Amen. I like what the Message Bible says. Those who discover these words live, really mm. live, body and soul, they're bursting with health. Isn't that great? It is. That's a, Love I that. mean, that's a... That's a great, great word right there. Tonight, and we're, we're talking about things in our, especially these, these sessions, these midweek section, sessions. We're talking to you about things that God's Word will do for you. And there's many, many, many things. I mean, we could make a list that go into infinity, I suppose, uh, about what God's Word will do for you. But we want to take a, a little time tonight to talk about God having a plan for your life. You're not here as an afterthought. You're not here as an accident. Um, I was a real famous preacher. And, uh, 
and he was reciting his story. He's in heaven now, and I won't share his name just out of courtesy to the story. But he was talking about how that uh, his parents had determined they're not going to have any more children. And that was before he was born. And he was a surprise. And uh, he was talking about how that uh, it might be a surprise to your parents, but it's not a surprise to God. <laughs> and, you know, they, you know, they, they were working people and, it, you know, they had a, as a scripture says, they had a quiver full. They, 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 their, their plate was full of kids. They had all they wanted. And, and one more is one more. And uh, this particular person I'm talking about, making reference to, literally preached face to face at one time to over a million of over a million people, face to face. I'm not talking through electronics. I'm talking about face to face on numbers of occasions all over the world. And so sometimes it may surprise the circumstance. It may not be what we would choose, but believe me. God knows exactly what he was doing. And he was, he's, of course, telling the story laughingly about, you know, his parents and the, uh, their surprise. But God not only had a surprise for his parents, he had a surprise for the devil, too. Look who's here. <laughs> and see, God has a plan for your life. Now, it might not be in the same way he had it for his life, um, not to stand before millions of people on numerous occasions all over the world and lead absolutely millions of people to Jesus Christ. Um, he may not have that plan, but I promise you he has a plan. And, uh, and that's what we want to talk about a little bit tonight. You know, we find over here in Jeremiah 29, 11, and if we read it out of the King James, it's, it's good. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. In other words, God's thinking about you. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and uh, not of evil, to give you an expected end. So God has a plan and he has good thoughts to think about you. But now if you read this out of the uh, NIV, it, it says it a little more directly to the point that I want to make with you tonight. He said, I know the plans that I have for you. And so God doesn't just have thoughts about us. He has a plan. Mm -hmm. He said, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you and plans to give you a hope and a future. And so God has a plan for our life. He has a good plan, not a bad plan, but a plan to prosper us. God's plan will prosper you. Now, God, and you know, sometimes we hear the word prosper and it's a Bible word. I just read that out of the Bible. But sometimes we, uh, we, we get short-sighted or, or misdirected a little bit when we think about prosperity. And, you know, that's one of those words that in our particular world today, we, we don't want to hear that in connection with the gospel or preaching or whatever because we sometimes feel like maybe some preacher or some group or somebody they've capitalized on it and taken unfair advantage of their circumstance. And I'm sure that's true, but it's still, nonetheless, it's a Bible truth that we have to deal with because it is in the word. Now the word prosper doesn't mean to make you filthy rich. The word prosper means to do better than you did. That's what prosper means. You come up. And I found that if you will, find your life in God and find God's plan for your life, it'll begin to take you on a prosperous journey. Now, a prosperous journey is not just loaded with all sorts of wealth. It may have that contained in it, but a prosperous journey is where you're the most fruitful. It's where you're the most fulfilled. A lot of people give away opportunities for wealth for the, for the sake of purpose in life. Because you can have a lot of money and not be satisfied. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can be working a job that pays extremely well, but find no peace in it. Because it's, it's not a part of God's destiny for you. It's not a part of what he planned for you. So we, f we find sometimes that, that money, when God says prosper you, 
money is, is just one little teeny part of that. Now, it takes money to live. We know that. But I can tell you what, if your pursuit in life is just money, yeah. you are of all men most miserable <laughs> because it's just not enough. There's things, I know when we begin to, well, we started this church, you know, in just a few weeks now. It's going to be 43 years ago. Mm -hmm. Man. Man. What, what happened? happened? Yeah. <laughs> I married a young. I, I married a young woman. <laughs> she married a young man. <laughs> exactly. Well, well we not even that. Probably just kids. But the truth of the matter, um, you know, you start out on this journey. But when we started on this journey, uh, as far as the, as far as financially, and as far as the earthly trappings are concerned, we made a major, major step backward. To obey God. Mm -hmm. Now he's long since made up for it uh, in lots of ways. And I'm not just talking about wealth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fulfillment, satisfaction, the things that come from, from knowing you're doing what God wants you to do and lives that were changed. You know, we, we just got to uh, communicate from some people that live far, far, far away from here. But they want to come and visit the church. They get, they got, uh, they found Jesus watching this, and they want to come and see us in church. Now, let me tell you something. There's no money that will give you that kind of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, it, it won't do that because you you see somebody's life begin to take on an eternal significance because of the influence that you've been able in some small way to bring into their life. You know, you can't take credit for it. It's God that gets all the credit for that. But you're not stupid either. He does use you to touch people. And you find great contentment in that and great fulfillment mm -hmm. in that. And, uh, you know, it's not how many people know your name. It's, it's not how big your bank account is. It's not about how much fame or power or prestige or honor, that, that's, that's just stuff. And all that stuff will pass away. But I'm gonna tell you these kind of things we're talking about, they have eternal significance and there's eternal consequence in it if we, if we obey God. And, and really by the same token, there's eternal consequence in it if you don't. See, God, the, the point that we're, we're making here is God has a plan for your life. And in that plan, it's a plan to prosper you, to give you hope, and to give you a future. A lot of times you see a lot of people living their life just seemingly butting their heads against the wall, just going from pillar to post, job to job, mm -hmm. city to city, state to state. They move all over and they're never content. And uh, you can't make the discontented be contented. And a lot of our discontent is not because uh, circumstances around you are bad is because you're not following God with a plan for your life. And I don't care what you do. You, you can have a factory job. You can have some sort of communication type job, technical job. You can have a, a job that, uh, well, it has a lot of maybe prestige to it. But I can tell you this, you will not find fulfillment if you do not do what God has planned for you. And, and you know, there's a there's a there's a misunderstanding, Nora, that that people have, and we get it from a lot of our success teaching. And a lot of success teaching is really good. A lot of it you find through the Bible, you find it in Proverbs and other places, but all through the Scriptures. And so I don't I don't put any of that down. But uh, secular success teaching, if you leave the God factor out, is really vain anyway. It, it, it tries to adopt and adapt scripture truth to a secular setting. And it just kind of doesn't work. Now, when I say a secular setting, I'm not talking about your job because your job, if you're following God's plan for your life is not secular. It's your calling. That's different. So that's not secular. But what I'm talking about, people who try to use uh, truths, that we know from scripture to prosper and succeed and get wealthy and accumulate and live the good life and have, drive the nice cars and 
wear the nice clothes and go to the great vacation spots of the world. Um, well, that's all good, and it's got it. You know, it's a, there's ne not necessarily anything sinful in that. But God has a bigger plan; He really does. Now, I, you know, I've had the privilege of preaching the gospel and traveling too through preaching the gospel. Sometimes you may go through a country on the way to another country, so you're not necessarily preaching in it, but you do have to visit it. You have to spend time in it, and so. Um, We've been um, to some 60 plus countries in doing that. We see a, a good part of the world, you know. And so a lot of people spend a lot of time accumulating a lot of wealth to go travel to these places that I've been to, and some of them many, many, many times, you know. And I can tell you this, if I never got on another airplane, it'd be okay with me. And all this, you know, I want to go, 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 go. I don't want to go, 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 go anywhere. I done went, 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 went. And I'm okay with not going, going, going. I'm okay with it. But now if God wants me to, I'm okay with that too. But there's a, there's a thing that some of the things that we desire the most, and people do desire to travel. They like to travel. They, it, that's, that's entertaining and all. It's, it's fun. But all the things that people pursue and seek, a lot of them came to me as a secondary benefit to obeying the calling. So you get it, but he has no sorrow with it. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's a, it's a fulfillment of your calling or a fulfillment of your, of your destiny or his plan for your life. And so all this teaching that says, well, the, be all you can be, uh, do all you can do and on and on. Well, I, I, I get it, but let me tell you something. You can't just get up one day and make your mind up what you're going to do and then go do it. You need to find out what God wants you to do and then For go sure. do that. Yeah. Because even if you get it, you probably won't like it unless you do it in God, God's way, and, and finding his plan and purpose. Well, you know, um, God's plan for our life was ministry. But that isn't, I mean, it is for some people, but for a lot of people, it isn't ministry. No. So whatever that is um, that God has right. for you, exactly. you pursue that. But I, I want to say this. Our pursuit was of God and his plan for our life. Right. It never was what can we get out of it. Right. And I think if you are um, this prosperity-minded right. You're thinking, how can I, for myself, my family, how can I generate the income? How can I live, um, you know, successfully right. for yourself? But that, the whole thing of Christianity, we learn a truth about prosperity, and then it turns into we're very short-sighted, mm -hmm. and we don't see the whole purpose of the gospel is for our lives to be fruitful for the work of the kingdom and right. for people, for individuals, right. for souls. Right. That's the whole purpose. Right. And so in doing what we did in 1978 had nothing to do with what we were going to get placed no. in our hands no, and in our life. Not. As a matter of fact, it's like you said, we, we gave up a lot of things right. to say yes to Jesus, right. but he's more than made it up in so many ways, like you said, so... Well, and he he does he will make it up to you materially. Don't don't misunderstand that. But if that's your goal, he probably won't. Yeah. Because your goal is misdirected. This is a this is an encounter to fulfill the plan of God, but in so doing, you're going to change lives. Now, I, I promise you somewhere in the process of what God has planned for you. I promise you somewhere in this, there will be some other person that you help and bless. It will, it will not be a self-serving exactly. uh, destination. Uh, now you, you may get extremely blessed out of it, but that's not the goal. And you see so many people, they, they want to go into ministry because they don't have a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've seen that a lot. It's like, 
well, it must be God's will for me to go into the ministry because I lost my job. It's like, well, I wouldn't take that as the lead. <laughs> I'd, I'd let it be something else. Because really, you know, when we started this, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not saying everybody's this way, but I was, um, I was not real thrilled about going in the ministry. It looked like to me the ticket to the poorhouse. You know what I'm talking about? Because I didn't, I didn't see any way God could even do anything for us. We we had a plan. We were working a plan, and it was working, believe me. And you look back on it now, it was working because that's what he wanted for us. Yeah, we were preparing for <laughs> yeah, the future. Yeah, that's what he wanted for us. But there was, a, there was a time that that quit being okay. It, it, you know, it, when the scripture talks about the eagle stirring up the nest. Now, in the story of the eagle, and most of you probably have heard this before, but uh, when an eagle builds the nest way high in the, in the rocks and high places where they do, um, they'll build that nest out of a lot of sticks and various things that they accumulate together, and they'll build it like a cradle, you know. But then they line that nest with feathers. And so that, that nest for, for the young eaglets is really comfortable. You know, there with mom, you know, being fed, you know, got the cot and the squares, you know what I'm talking about? Got everything going. And then there comes a time as those eaglets begin to grow that there's a time that they have to begin to think about getting out of the nest. If they stay too long, it's detrimental for them. They're not created to live in the nest. They're created to fly. They're created to, to, to do things that eagles do. And the Bible gives us a lot of analogies for our life, even, even being like an eagle. You know, some of us want to, you know, be like the, the, the little bird in the yard, the wren or something, you know, but God wants us to be more, uh, well, I'll say adventurous. I'll just leave it at that. Um, I could say a lot there. I'll just leave it at that. But, um, uh, that mother eagle, now, now they may be way up on a cliff and it may be a, a thousand foot drop straight down. And that mother eagle will, will take those feathers out of that nest so that she begins to stir up that nest so that that little baby eaglet who's now beginning to get a little older and got the wings and got the equipment for flying they begin to, to make it uncomfortable for that eagle to stay. And so mom will kick them out of the nest. Now, she won't let them fall, but they'll know they're going down if they don't stretch out those wings. And mom's always there. She can come down. She can put them, put them on her back and rescue them if it turned into a problem. There's ways. But the point is, is sometimes that God stirs up our nest. And what you used to do that was working for you just fine and it was feeding you and it was comfortable to you, there's a time sometimes in life that that's not going to be comfortable to you anymore. Now, that's a little bit of how you begin to know and discover the plan of God for your life. I know along the way, we, we did a lot of things in church. Uh, long before we ever knew we were called into ministry, we just worked in church. Worked with young people, worked with, I, we, we did everything. Yeah. You know, whatever, they, they needed a volunteer. Here it is. You know, we just did everything, whatever they wanted. We'd see, yeah. here it is. Pulled That's, the weeds in the parking lot. <laughs> pulled whatever. the weeds in the parking lot. It didn't make any difference what it was. And uh, a lot of times that you, you find by experiment, uh, a lot of times you, you don't find necessarily your calling you find what you're not called to do. Now I learned through working with children and we work with youth and we and had great success with it we too. Really did. really did. I mean, tremendous success. But I learned along the way, I'm not called to do that. that. That is not a part of my calling. Not that I didn't enjoy it when I did it, 
and we succeeded at it when we did it. And it was a great blessing to the church and to the young people and to us. But it was not my calling. And so you, you begin to eliminate. You know, there's a, there's a way sometimes that we discover the will of God. And you remember when the prophet went down to Jesse's house and God told him to go down there and anoint the next king. You know, when Saul was doing all the stuff he was doing, wasn't acting right. God was raising up somebody else to take his place. And when those young boys came through, Jesse's sons began to come through. And, you know, you got the tall one, you got the stalwart, you got the big one, you got the muscular one, you got all these that look like they're going to be just it. Um, and they come through and the prophet said, it's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. And finally get through and run the whole gamut of those that would surely be the ones. And uh, he said to, the prophet said to Jesse, he said, you got any more? He said, well, well I, got my, I got my young son out here tending sheep. He said, go get him. And see, the one that looked least likely and the one that nobody would have thought is the one that God chose. And he brought David in there and, and the prophet anointed him to be king. Now, it took a long time to get him there. But, it, but that anointing came on him from that day. And there were a number of things that happened in David's life. You know, when he, when he slew the lion by tending sheep. He was out there protecting the sheep. And he slew the bear. And, and now, let, let me tell you, around here in East Tennessee, we got some wild cats. You know, uh, and I think there are actually a few mountain lions around here. Uh, probably not many, but you know, we got, you know, bobcats and various things. And some of us got house cats that we mistake for wildcats. I've seen that on the news, but anyway, it's interesting. But to where, uh, where Israel is located is kind of a land bridge between Europe and Asia and Africa. So when you talk about a line there, you're talking about an African line. You're not talking about a pussy cat. You ain't talking about a house cat. You ain't talking about a bobcat. You're talking about a lion. So understand that. Well, here's a predator lion trying to get a, a, a sheep that's completely defenseless against it. And here's a shepherd boy takes on a lion to protect a sheep. Hmm. Now, that's some kind of brave. I'm going to tell you right now. And a bear, I mean, bears, not, I mean, you know, strong as a bear. You hear the phrase? So through his care for the sheep, he learned how to defend the sheep and he learned how to trust God and how to do things. You have to be extremely resourceful. You're out there by yourself. What are you going to do? Call 911? You got to figure this out. And he did figure it out and he figured out how to win. Well, now that very experience is, is what caused him when he went down to take lunch to his brothers. Uh, you know, in, in that time in Israel, if you were 20 years old, you had to be in the army. Well, he was under 20 because he wasn't in the army and his brothers were. And they went down there to the valley where Goliath is standing yelling out threatenings to the people of Israel and talking about what he's going to do to them. And David came down there and, uh, you know, they ridiculed him for being nosy and sticking his nose in where it didn't belong. And his brothers didn't appreciate him and all and all and all and all. And his brothers began to turn, turn to him and, and run him down, little brother. And he turned away. He didn't, he didn't even talk to him. And uh, he said, he said uh, the king, he said, what is the, what's the payday for the one who takes this guy out? He said, well, you get the king's daughter, you get tax-free living, you know, a bunch of things. He said, well, uh, let me do this. So the time with the lion and the time with the bear is what gave him the Goliath. So faithfulness over the little is what causes you to be put in a position where you can go to the throne. Because what put David on the throne was Goliath. Because they come out singing the songs, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So Saul knew from that day forward that anointing for king had gone to somebody else. And it, it absolutely uh, 
Well, it ate Saul up with jealousy. He tried to kill David in every way imaginable because he saw the shift coming. He knew internally that it would happen. But see, it happened down there at Jesse's house. God called David and told him what he was going to do with him, and then he created circumstance. So God has a plan for your life, and he'll create the circumstance that'll take you there. But you've got to be faithful in the little before you're going to get to the much. That's just the way it works. And so, uh, you know, when you're king of a nation, you're prospering, you know, but that wasn't the goal. That was a secondary benefit from a, another thing altogether. He learned to lead men. He took men that were in debt and discontent and dissatisfied and disgruntled. Mm -hmm. And he made them through his leadership. He made them a mighty Mighty men. Scripture says they were mighty men of valor. Yeah. They learned how to be an army. They learned how to be uh, work as a unit. These men were like, I'm telling you, you read the stories on it. You talk about these Marvel comic movies. These guys were supermen. I'm telling you what they were able to do. They were literally, in every sense of the word, they were, they were superhuman in what they were able to pull off. And they started as misfits. Misfits. Isn't that something how mm -hmm. God can take our lives and, <clears throat> excuse me, you could look at someone or even your own self and, well, I couldn't accomplish that. But God through you could. I love the story of David, though, because when Jesse went down there mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, anoint or not Jesse, the prophet. yeah, the yeah, prophet, right. mm -hmm. to Jesse's house yeah. and was going to anoint um, <clears throat> David at that time. The anointing, like you said, came on him, right. but he had so many difficult mm -hmm. circumstances right. that he had to overcome. Right. And I can just imagine David in the middle of that and, and thinking, God, I thought you anointed me. And many of us can probably identify with that in our lives when we're going through, God, I thought you wanted me to do this. God, I thought you had called me to do that. But it's difficult and hard, but you have to remain faithful and keep going and understand God has his hand on you for his purpose and his plan. You'll overcome every one of those things. You'll overcome them and get to the place where um, you know, you fit like a hand in glove into the purpose and plan of God for your life. But uh, many times it's not easy. You know why? Because the devil fights us. He fights the plan that God has for his life and for our life. And we just need to understand that just because everything doesn't go smooth sailing, and a lot of people think that it should go really smooth if this is, you know, the plan and purpose, but it doesn't <laughs> yeah, always go that, that way, as we all know. Well, you know, there's a, I, I keep getting this little nudge internally when, when we talk about this here, but there's a, there's probably a need to draw some attention to the word loyalty here somewhere. Because, these men that were the misfits you talk about, they were disgruntled, dissatisfied. They, they had not found the purpose for their life. See, God had a plan for them too. He didn't just have a plan for David. He mm -hmm. had a plan, plan for those men too. Yeah. Now, you know, it's interesting. We find in the book of Habakkuk, and we, we hear a lot of teaching on vision. And again, it goes into this, some of this success teaching that we have from the secular world. And you know, you gotta have a vision. You gotta be going somewhere and on and on. Well, I agree with that. Without a vision, my people perish or people are destroyed. So you need a vision for your life, but you gotta take the vision that God gives you. You can't just, you know, dream up one, Right. you know. But the Bible says in the book of Habakkuk, write the vision, make it plain that he may run that reads it. And at the end it shall speak and it shall not, it shall not lie and it'll not tarry. And there's a lot said there. But the point that, that I want to make is, is when God begins to speak a plan into your life, you, you, you make a vision out of it in the sense that vision is, is where you're going. It's, it's where you want to go. A vision is something you see that nobody else sees. It's something that takes you beyond the clutter, beyond the problems, the difficulties, and it takes you to a place. It, it's really an imagination the Bible says to cast down evil imaginations, but a godly imagination will take you somewhere. God will give you a, a, 
an imagination that will dream the dreams and, and cast the visions and on and on and on. But the vision that God gave to David or the dream or the destiny that he gave to the plan that he gave to David included others. And there, was, there were men that were attached to him to help him get to where he needed to be. So we find loyalty was necessary, not in just fulfilling what David was called to do, but in fulfilling what these other men were called to do as well. They had to attach themselves to somebody. Now, there's a, there's a lot, I think, there's, I think to the point of even a mistake, there's so much talk about vision. Everybody feels like, well, I'm entitled to a vision. Well, you are, but you, you aren't always. Now, for you personally, your family, your, your personal choices and things like that, 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 of course, you have power and control over. But if everybody has a vision, it's, it's like, if, I don't know if you've ever been to, a, to a, an orchestra and listened to a, a symphony play. And when you go in and you begin to take your seat and there's still clamor and people are moving around and on and on, you'll hear all these people tuning their instruments and there, there's all sorts of noise and it's, it's, it's pretty noise. I mean, it's beautiful noise, but it's all disconnected noise. It has no harmony to it. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Now that word agree means to harmonize. And so you, you go in and you listen to these, these great musicians and they play, they play their various instruments, strings and horns and various things, percussion and all. And, and it's, it's just disconnected until it finds a focus. Paul said this one thing I do. He didn't say this hundred and one things I do. He said this one thing I do forgetting those things that are behind, pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus, God's plan for his life. He did one thing, not 21 things. And so a lot of times we think, okay, we're all entitled to a vision. Well, we are, again, in our personal life for our personal reasons. But when we come into God, all of us at some point in time are have to gonna buy, we're probably going to have to buy into somebody else's vision. Because remember, God said, write the vision and make it plain that he may run that reads it. So this vision was given to one person so that everybody else could find purpose in life. Not exactly what we want to hear in our society, is it? Well, I want to be all I can be. I know. But to be all you can be, you may have to buy into what somebody else is doing. And, and get rid of your pride. Get rid of a lot of self. But, you know, it's not just one-way loyalty. Those men had to be loyal to David. But there's a story. When they're out fighting their battles and doing the stuff that they did, and, boy, they had some wars, didn't they? I'm I mean, sure they, they really are. did, and it was tough. And these mighty men of valor, David happened to say, wouldn't it be great to have some water from back home? You know how you go around the world and you go all over the place and, and no water is like home water, you know? You, you go to places, they may have good water, but it's not like home water. It's like home cooking. Nobody makes biscuits like mama. You know what I mean? And David happened to mention, he said, he said wouldn't it be great to have some water from back home? Well, some guys heard him say that and they took it upon themselves to go through the enemy lines to endanger themselves, to go back and get him. They were so desirous to be in harmony and to please this, their leader that they risked their lives to go back and get him water and bring it to him. When they brought that water to him, you know, you, you'd think the natural response is, wonderful, thank you, and just drink the water. But, you know, that's not what David did. He said, I can't do this. He said, there's a part of me, my integrity to you will not allow me to drink this water unless we all drink it together. So he poured it out. 
not in rebellion or not belittling or making light of what they did, but to say to them, I'm in such harmony with you and my loyalty is not just to myself and you being loyal to me, but I'm loyal to you too. And we're going to do this together. And you know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that causes people to exceed and excel what others just try and try and try for. That's what makes a church successful when the people have a heart to pull together and work together. The devil wants to destroy that with everything that's in him. For he sure. has no defense against it. He just has none. But the Bible, you know, actually when it talks about spots, you know, when Jesus, is, the scripture says that he's coming for a church without spot and wrinkle and blemish. If you study that word spot, it actually talks about, Peter talked about it. He said, it's, he said, it's people that come into your love feast, and that's the words he used. They come into your times in a church where you celebrate one another and you, you, you love and you share and you do the things that, that people who care for one another do. And they come into your love feast and they kind of, they try to tear it up. They try to ruin everything that you do. And that's the spots that he's talking about. It's not just some little, you know, fly in the buttermilk. It's a Christian, so-called, that wants to destroy everything that God calls sacred and good that's built into our heart by being loyal, faithful, and, and in harmony with one another. Because I can tell you this, when you get a group of people in harmony, there is nothing. Why do you think the government and everybody else is trying to tear up this country so bad and try to keep everybody against everybody? It doesn't matter what you are. Gender, color, race, it don't matter. Politics, jabbed or unjabbed, you know, it's like I'm in better. Tear up everything because he knows that, that to divide you is to conquer you. This is a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I mean, it's just constant. I mean, and that's, the, that's probably the biggest thing that we deal with in life in general to stop the plan of God from coming to pass is just to keep strife always at the door, just mm -hmm. always nagging and needling. Well, I think, you know, what you're talking about here about the vision, running with the vision and, and that, I think that's what the church is all about. Yeah. And every local church does not have the same vision. No, not at all. Now, we've got the responsibility to take Jesus to the world, make Jesus known, mm -hmm. but there's emphasis inside local mm -hmm. churches that God gives Mm -hmm. the leadership, and it permeates out mm -hmm. in, into the body, and they carry out mm -hmm. that vision and connect into the vision and are not separated, but they're united. And there's something about unity that is so powerful. It really is. Unity brings the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the scene. And sad to say, maybe that's why in many cases in our local churches, and I'm not pointing to anyone, but in local churches, many times we cannot experience that anointing and God moving and working because there's dissension and strife like you were talking mm -hmm. about. But if we get in unity and harmony, it's amazing what God can do through a group of people. Well, he illustrated that. He said, you know, that anointing came down and flowed down on the beard and, yeah. you know, down to the body. You find it in the book of Psalms. Exactly. But it's an amazing story how that, that that anointing will flow when you find harmony and unity in a house and with a group of people. But it probably, to be honest with you, is the most difficult thing to, to, to get. And then once you get it, probably equally as difficult to maintain it because the devil's always trying to needle it and tear it up because he knows that if he can, he won't just destroy the movement. He'll destroy the individuals. That's, he'll stop the goals, the vision. He'll stop the vision from coming to pass, but he'll destroy the lives of, of, of people. The Bible says those who are in strife are taken captive by Satan at his will. And so if we get into strife, if we allow that to be a rule in our life, uh, it'll destroy everything that we're about, everything that we're for. And, you know, because when the Bible says taken captive by Satan at his will, mm -hmm. trust me, you know, there's like the, the ace in the hole, as you, as you say. Uh, Satan holds the, he holds the trump card. And when you get in strife, 
He's not going to play that card on you when it's most convenient. He's going to wait till you are absolutely backed up in a corner against a wall with no answer. And then he's going to play the card on you. He's going to take you out if he can. He won't play it when it's convenient. He's going to play it when it's at your worst. And you Amen. think, well, I don't think I can take any more. Well, you get strife in your life. You're getting ready to get some more. You can't stop it. See, that's the thing. Well, I'm binding and loosening and I'm praying and I'm fasting. It don't matter. It makes no difference. If you, Jesus, Jesus told the people in his great faith teaching on speaking to the mountain. He said, speak to the mountain and it'll obey you. He said that. If you believe in your heart and say to the mountain, it'll obey you. But he, then he went out right on to say, he said, but uh, if you have aught against any, forgive them. Because he said, you can talk to the mountain all you want to, but if you don't walk in harmony and don't walk in love, it won't work. See, and that's, what, that's why we see people do a lot of stuff, Bible stuff. They pray, they fast, they do all sorts of things. But then those first things are, are left, they're left neglected. And you got to get rid of the first things that are troubling you before you're going to get to the other things. Amen. And you know, those things with David and his men, they had learned to walk together in harmony. And, and you, you see David, even with King Saul, he had more than one occasion. When Saul was trying to kill him, Saul was absolutely trying to hunt him down and kill him. And David, on two occasions, Saul was put in his hands and, say, and, and David could have taken him out for sure. And he said, I touch not God's anointing, anointed one. He wouldn't do it. And he could have. And you say, well, he should have done it so he could have shortened his trip to the throne. Well, if you don't get there, the Bible says if you, if you don't strive lawfully, you're not crowned. Any man that strives for masteries, if he doesn't strive lawfully, is, is not crowned. You, if you get there, you know, you see some of these, these marathon runners and the cross country runners and on and on and on. Uh, and I've seen stories where, you know, they take a shortcut, you know, they, they, they nobody's watching and they'll, you know, cr cut across, <laughs> you know, they'll take a quick, quick, quick way. Well, you got to stay on the course, you know, because if you get caught cheating, you may get to the finish line first, but you don't get the crown doesn't work you got to get there lawfully you got to do it according to the rules that's the way life is you got to do it according to the rules you know amen amen well you know uh god has a you know we we didn't have touch hardly anything on this paper <laughs> we must have touched what the lord we touched wanted what to i guess we're we? supposed to but what i i guess the the, the main thing that we want to get across to you is you're important to God and God has a plan for your life. You're not here just as an afterthought. You're not here as just somebody to breathe good air and drink up good water and take up space. You're not a consumer. I don't care what a bunch of people out here want to tell you. You're a planned person put here by God for a reason. It's offensive for people to call you or me a consumer. We're not consumers. We're contributors. Amen. And that's important to underline that in your thinking. God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. And he wants you to be in it. But you're going to find the plan of God. Number one thing that you've got to do is come through the cross. You've got to come through the Christ. You've got to come through what Jesus did for you. You can't really get the plan of God until you first come to the Lord. That's when it all begins to start. There's a lot more than that, but that's where it all starts. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that's the first step on the plan of God for your life. That's number one. The Bible says that today's the day. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. He never says do it tomorrow. He never says wait till next week. He never says put it off. If we put it off or we say I'll get to it later, that's a decision. The same as deciding for Christ, that's a decision against. So you have to choose. And the only way you can do it is do it now. Now faith is. There's a time you're going to come to the now. 
And right now is your time. Pray this simple prayer with me. It's simple, but it's profound. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. I repent of my sins. And Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I know you meant it or you wouldn't pray it. It's the most important prayer you could ever pray, believe me. And every one of us, we in some form, we've had to pray that same prayer. Each of us that have come to Christ, we've asked him to come into our heart to be our Savior, to be our Lord. And he does it. He never, he said, he said if you'll come to me, I'll in no wise cast you out. I'll never turn you away. So he doesn't turn us away. He always receives us. Let us know, though, there's a way there on the screen you can do it. The reason it's important for you to do that is because he said, if you're ashamed to confess him before men, he'll be ashamed to confess you before the Father and before the angels. So you have to tell somebody. Now, if there's a person there close to you, with you, you can tell them. That's very, very appropriate and, and right. Uh, but let us know because we want to pray with you. And I know that you know, all of us gathered this way, we may never meet you on this earth. We might, but we may not. But if we don't meet you here, we know we're going to see you there. We know we're going to see you when we all stand before that great throne of God one day, when we all go to our final home, our place of reward. And that's what it's really all about. We're not living for this earth. We're living for that. That's our, that's our time. That's what's coming. And so we, we, we thank God for you, and, and we, we pray that God would, would solidify you in the faith. It should be not rocky in it, but believe what you've done and be cemented in the kingdom the way God wants you to be. Amen. And, you know, if you prayed that prayer tonight, you might be in this room or online. We have literature that we would love uh, to get to you, a packet that has information now that you've come to the Lord. And if you don't have a Bible, we can get a Bible to you. I know a lot of people have Bibles, right. and that's good. But if you don't, we can get a Bible to you. So if you will let us know that, we'll take care of it. Amen. Well, we're going to pray with you and bless you before we go. Father, we pray for our precious friends. They're very important to us, very important to you. We ask you to bless their life, bless their home, bless their household, bless the labor of their hand, bless all that they do. And, Lord, we speak favor, prosperity, wholeness, and healing, and soundness into their life right now. We look forward to our next time together in Jesus' name. Before we leave, let me mention to you, uh, we'll be here again uh, this way in a little different form, a little different format, but we'll be here again Sunday morning at 1030 Eastern Standard Time. And so wherever you are in the world, uh, we can see you then. We love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.